This is Urban Agriculture, episode number 19, Urban Ag Evangelists. This is Urban Agriculture, episode 19, recorded on September 16th, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and across from me is Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. How have you been, Dixon? Well, since this morning, when you asked the same question on episode 18, I'm fine, thank you. Because <laughs> you've given them the date on this. so I know I've given them the date. So I'm we've well recorded aware. two urban ags in one day, and but we get complaints because we don't do this you? often enough. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. I haven't changed. You haven't my changed demeanor, since this morning? My demeanor hasn't changed in, less than, in all of three hours, I would say. I'm not even all talked out because... You're not going to be talked out ever, are you? Well, I might. It's yeah. 25 Celsius right now and sunny. Oh, that's a good thing to bring going up to, to 26. On. It's partly cloudy out there, a lot of contrails. I can see them, a lot of travel going on today. Really nice day. It's a beautiful day, though. Low humidity, nice temperatures. What more do you want? All right, this episode... <clears throat> yes. I want you to have us up to date on what's happening in the world of indoor farming since yeah okay. since the last episode That's and fine. then i would like to go through our backlog of listener email i would be happy and to i do want that. erudite answers from you <laughs> erudite answers right is that possible it's possible so i i've only got two new only, stories only then it's failing vertical farming is failing you're saying no it's not failing at all in fact that's what these stories are all about why it is succeeding so the first story, it's a little a snippet of news, basically. There's a wonderful vertical farm in Portage, Indiana, called Green Sense Farms. And the news on the street, as they would say, is that this company has recently been in touch with the country of China, <clears throat> and they have reached an agreement to replicate what Green Sense Farms is doing in Portage in various parts of China. Now, we don't have details as to where in China this is going to occur, but we do have a, a little insight as to how extensive this will be. They have enlisted the services of GreenSense Farms to establish 20 versions of GreenSense Farm vertical farms in China. Now, that's a remarkable step forward, I think, in making um, vertical farming more universal in bringing fresh produce to larger communities of consumers. Obviously, it's it's hard to beat China for, for large communities living in urban centers. And it's a great sign to see that, that, for once, a country has come to the United States seeking technological help in a, in a field that's usually uh, taken care of by the country itself, namely agriculture. So, so the United States is becoming recognized as a leader in indoor urban farming. And that's the significance of this report that I think I would like to share with you. Did we listeners. talk with uh, Green Sense on No, but we've show. scheduled a, a conference with them. So we, we're going to hear more about this we have? in the near future. We have, in fact. So the other piece of news Wait, that I've got... I don't think we've scheduled it, but we have someone else from California. We do. Well, that's the next piece of news. Let me just interrupt before you continue. I found an article yes. in NWI... Dot com, the Times of uh, this is some online paper. Yeah. Green Sense Farm expands to China. Uh, the first farm is being built as we speak in Shenzhen. Shenzhen. You know where Shenzhen is? It's in South China. Is it near what big city? I think it's near Shanghai. It's near Hong Kong. Oh, I'm sorry, Hong Kong. And Robert Colangelo, who yep. is the CEO. No, went no, there. I've, I've spoken with him, and he and I are uh, more than acquaintances. We've seen each other at meetings, etc. So I'm excited for him and his company because it means that not only are they successful here, but they're now no go going to be successful in other places. As Maybe. Well. No, I think this we'll is a see. sign of the times. I, I think, think that's you what's need going to, on. You need to go to China and take Again? a tour of this facility. <laughs> I would love to. Go ahead. In fact, I'd, I'd like to take you with me, kicking and screaming with the uh, video camera that we have and, and make a podcast from that place. That would be great. All right, we'll work on it. We will work on it. What's the other bit of the news? The other piece of news is similar, only uh, domestic. Mm -hmm. There's a company in Irvine, California, which I think we've uh, mentioned before on one of our Urban Ag programs called Urban Produce. Urban Produce. Urban Produce. So got if you go it. to the internet, you can get them there. And that's the group that we've got a, a date with in that's the right. near future. And, and they've announced 
um, at least the rumor has it that they've announced three more facilities in the state of California. I can't think of another place that this would be more appreciated than California right now because of their situation. Not only are the fires destroying lots of properties, but the heat wave has taken its toll on agriculture in California uh, so that they're in debt, so to speak, for crop production in the billions and billions of dollars. Indoor farming is one of those answers to that problem, and uh, urban produce is taking the lead here, and I think that's great. And so I was told by someone who should know, uh, namely one of the co-founders for the Association for Vertical Farming, that urban produce is opening a vertical farm in San Francisco. So that should be great news. And again, we're going to have them on our show so we can either confirm or um, uh, expand upon those themes. So lots of exciting things in the world happening. And those are just two of many other things that I could talk about. But I think we've got all these emails that we have not answered. Well, so I think Give me one more thing we could talk about. Just one more thing? Yeah. Um, Lumatex has recently announced a 50% reduction in their fees hmm. for purchasing LED lights for growing. There are... Um, apparently uh, grants available which will offset the cost of these lighting systems so that if you're a startup and you want to install LED lights, I would highly recommend not that I work for Lumitex at all, but uh, I found that announcement uh, fascinating. I got an email from them, so I should share that with uh, our listening audience. All right. Now, you mentioned that the New York Times has an article on the front page today. I was told that in their video section of video for the New York Times that there's an article about a, um, a California-based initiative, I think it was UC Davis, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in vertical farming, some announcement, but I, I haven't read the article and I haven't seen the video, so I can't honestly con- confirm that. But I know that we have access to the internet because we're sitting in our office. I'm looking for it as you speak, Dixon, so, so keep speaking. If you go into the search mode for vertical farms and on the New York Times front page in the search There's box, no more front page, you know. Well, I think uh, I could. We can find that reference out and list it in the show notes if we don't come up with it right now. So I think that uh, it's exciting to see how much attention this subject is getting in the press, though, because uh, the fact that Aero Farms is right across the river and about to uh, announce their opening. Uh, I was at a meeting on the weekend called um, Taste Talks in Brooklyn. And uh, one of the vendors that was uh, at that show, uh, uh, touting their wares, so to speak, was um, City Hydroponics, which has taken over several floors worth of uh, an old abandoned Pfizer building in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. And they consider themselves a vertical farm, and they're going to get bigger. They've got 10,000 square feet of growing space. So that's just another story that I could add to this growing list of uh, successes. I found it. Good. It's, and what does it um, say? It's called The Roots of Organic Farming on Campus uh, by the University uh, of California. Mark Bittman learns about an innovative apprenticeship right. program that is aiming to improve the way we eat, farm, and garden. This is outdoor farming. Outdoors. Does that count? No. We cannot talk about outdoor farming here on urban No, we can, culture. but I mean, some outdoor farming is urban farming. I mean, you know, um, Brooklyn Grange is an outdoor farm. Okay. In the Urban Center. So. Let's do some email. Great. I'm going to read the first one. Would you please? First one is from Trudy, who is referring to an email we read a while ago from Uh someone who didn't like urban agriculture. Oh. Because it was too long and rambling. You know. Or to each their own. You know, it's not just a matter of opinion, though. Remember, science is not uh, a belief system. So the (laughs) science of indoor farming has been proven out. So I, I think that. Whether you like it or not, it's here to stay. Well, I don't think they like the format of our show. That's oh, I see. Oh, no, I not see the, what you mean. Oh, I see what you're saying. Anyway, Trudy writes, perhaps Roy, who wrote that previous letter, doesn't appreciate your approach, ah. but I find it to be interesting. Mm-hmm. Educators know that repetition helps the student. <laughs> your style makes this podcast interesting to citizen scientists, gardeners, and many others. Personally, I find the informal dialogue to have a great balance between information, which could be a bit dry, and discussion, which has some humor to strike just the right note. I have recommended this podcast to friends, family, and my favorite market, which also has a farm and is looking to expand options to grow in an 
empty former grocery store. My Interesting. Thank you both from a listener to all the TWIV-related podcasts. Trudy is from Naples, Florida. I love it. Naples, beautiful city. I've been there many times. Florida? Hope to, hope to get there again. Mm-hmm. Or Italy. To Naples. Have you been to Naples, Italy? I have not. It's also a very nice city. So I've understood. And the cuisine is absolutely fantastic there. So I, 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 I would... One day. I, I know that the saying in Naples is, see Naples and die. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> that's, their, that's their city motto. I didn't know You haven't that. seen the world until you've seen Naples. All right. Can you so, okay. eat the next sure, one? Sure, I can take the next one. So another T writer, in this case Todd, writes, Hi, Dr. DePommier and Dr. Racaniello. <clears throat> Just listened to the first episode of Urban Agriculture and really enjoyed it. I'm a plant pathologist, and I agree with much of what you say about monocultures. They certainly do have a lot of insect and disease issues. Parasites are never far behind. I look forward to catching up on the newer episodes and learning more about vertical farming. I've also been listening to TWIV and TWIM for a while, and they're among my favorite podcasts. I appreciate the evidence-based information. The topics are fascinating, and you all seem to have a good time. Scientists are people, too. (laughs) Thank, thank you for recognizing that. Anyway, I just wanted to thank you for all the, the all that you do, both professionally and with the podcasts. They're great. Well, we consider our podcast as part of our professional activity, so I think that you could throw that into the mix as well. Best regards, Tom. Todd. Todd. Dixon, you have trouble reading today? Would you like to step back? You want back? me to do that again? No, no. <laughs> just, Sometimes I like to give you a little, my eyes are faster than my mouth. I like to give you some grief. You do. As you know. Well, you know I don't take you seriously anyway, so it doesn't matter. Well, what does it mean when you burst out crying? <laughs> oh, I was. those are tears of joy. Yeah. <laughs> Next one is from Mary Jo, who writes, Hello, discovered your podcast recently and really enjoy the topics and the expertise that you provide. I listen to a wide variety of podcasts, so if I may offer some very frank but well-meant piece of feedback, you guys really ramble throughout the conversation. Uh-huh. I think with some thoughtful editing, the podcast could easily be 40 <laughs> minutes long and still allow you to make all of the points you want to make. If it's possible for all comments that eventually make it to air to stay more closely aligned with the topic of the podcast, it would allow for better listening experience. So far in the episodes that I've listened to, I have done a lot of skimming through or fast forwarding. Thanks for the opportunity to provide this feedback. Again, I really appreciate the topics offered and the expertise your show offers. These comments are well meant and I look forward to continued success of your show. Respectfully, Mary Jo. Okay. Well, Do you have a I, comment I, on that one, Vincent? I don't think we ramble. I mean, I, I can Not understand. Necessarily. I think in some of the earlier episodes, people did say some of them went on a little long, but we don't do that anymore. As for putting the the emails topically, this is not possible because they're really all over the place, yeah. and it's very hard to yeah. do that. So I'm really sorry if you have to search around. One of our models for beginning these podcasts was Car Talk, and do you want to talk about rambling? <laughs> did they ramble? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Well, part of the charm of but, that show was the ramble. And the, and they were very popular, weren't they? They were, but it, it's not just a matter of being popular. I, I kind of agree a little bit with what she says because I think we do tend to drift off the topic every now and then when interesting things pop up. But you know, it's just part of life, I think. Uh, again, so, you can so, fast forward it. You're right. So you, you know, have to listen. Car talk wasn't for everyone, right? But it was for an awful lot of people. Yeah, but they, not everyone liked it. That's the point. Well, you, and, and so Mary Lincoln Joe had a best, the best thing to say about that, right? You can please all the yeah, people some of the time. And some on that people. note, let's go to the next email. You betcha. So Rachel writes, Greetings, doctors. Thank you so much for not just the podcast, but TWIP as well. I wrote into a TWIP years ago when I first started my PhD, and along with other micro world podcasts, got me through countless nights of microscopy and blotting. <laughs> I'm writing a few months after, I'm writing a few months after defending, and shows like yours helped remind me that there is science going on outside of the GPCR trafficking I've been buried in. On what, on to what I actually wanted to share. You're right, I'm having problems reading today. Let's just try that one line again. On to what I actually wanted to share. I recently spent some time in Uganda to teach at a girls' science camp and found that even in the largest city, Kampala, food crops and animals are growing everywhere. Banana trees and maize plants fill many backyards, alleys, and any other unclaimed land with sunlight. This goes the same for animals. Cows, goats, and chickens were present throughout the urban areas. While this represents uh, sort of health issues for both the plants slash animals and the humans that go on to eat things grown in urban waste, I thought it was fascinating that a young city in a developing nation 
the idea of having food grown far from the population is not assumed like it is here in the States. This seems like there should be great opportunities to develop urban ag in these sorts of cities before people start to think it's strange to have crops near them. Do you know of any projects in Africa? Uh, to be honest, I, I, I know of some thought processes going on right now in places like Kenya and perhaps Egypt, but I don't know of any actual projects. Um, this podcast is focused on production of plants, but I think production of insects for food could be another major branch of urban agriculture. Unlike cows, chickens, and pigs, insects are easy to keep in great numbers in very small rooms with minimal waste production. I think it would be awesome to have an episode where you interview one of the companies trying to get entomophagy going in America. That means eating insects. <laughs> I've attached a few relevant links below, and I think there's a, a yuck factor involved in eating insects, regardless of whether you've desiccated them and made them into a flour-like powder that you can mix into other foodstuffs. I've watched shows where they've taken crickets, for instance, and uh, grasshoppers and mealworms, and they've either fried them or they've desiccated them, and then they've ground them up so that you can't recognize really what you're eating. And they, they do have a sweet flavor because a lot of their constituents parts are made out of things like chitin, which is a polysaccharide, uh, all bunched up together. The unfortunate part of that is that the polysaccharides are undigestible. We don't have chitinases, so that's not going to work for us. The protein part of the insect, though, I think is a real resource. And uh, let's face it, when you eat at a New York restaurant, I know this is going to get a smile from some people. There are insect parts in those foods that you're eating, but you yeah, just yeah. don't know where they are. So we can't avoid eating insects, but uh, to actually consciously think about eating you know, cricket cereals for breakfast and grasshopper lunches and uh, earthworm dinners. I think people will draw lines at this point, and I think this will not be for everybody. How's that? But it's interesting to think about. This is the second email we've had about yeah. this, and I think we should get someone on the show who's sure. working on this to talk about it. The biggest problem with eating insects is that you have to feed them. <laughs> so what do you feed the insects? Why don't you just eat what you feed to the insects and skip the middleman? No, that's not very good. That mealy stuff that you feed insects. No, Nobody no, no, wants to eat no, that. No, they eat flour. Uh, they can eat other things, too. <laughs> okay. Um, why isn't there any vertical farming in Africa? Good question. I, I don't know. I really don't know the answer to well, that. Well, then you can't do a podcast called Urban Ag, do you, can you, if you don't well, I know? I can't do a, a podcast <laughs> called Global Urban Ag. Not well, yet. we're being regional now, are we? Well, we're excluding the <laughs> African continent, unfortunately, because I don't know of any examples. I honestly really don't. But what is the reason? Is it because they have plenty of land and they don't need to do this I, at the No, at the time? because there's, there's no... I think Caleb Harper on our last podcast touched upon a little bit that it's it tends to the countries tend to break down into tribes and they tend not to share information from one part of Africa to another so there's no unification idea like there is for instance in Europe with the European Union so there's and they're technologically um fragmented okay. so that there aren't too many regional universities that specialize in technologies and um for that reason maybe that's the reason why it hasn't happened there yet but I think it will happen there I, I honestly do the next one is from Robin, who says, who writes, Stephen Colbert calls out, I'm not a scientist, climate change deniers. <laughs> and he sends a link to a video of that. Right. Good for him. Right. The next one's from Megan. Hello, professors. I wanted to share, to write, to share this article about germless, soilless lettuce farming in a Toshiba factory in Japan. I thought the germless concept was interesting, although... I'm sure you have heard of this before. The main reason this piqued my interest is because I came across this article on the front page of Reddit. I'm not sure if either of you know much about Reddit, but in case you don't, being on the front page means that pretty much every pr computer programmer, software engineer, <laughs> techie, etc. in America saw this. My husband is a software engineer, so I can confirm that. Just excited to see that Urban Ag is making it a little further into the mainstream. Thanks for all the knowledge you share, Megan. Here's the link to the article, and she's also attached to PDF. I am very well aware of Megan, uh, I'm sorry, of Reddit, <laughs> Megan, because I have young children who spend lots of time on Reddit, and they're uh, always telling me about it. And Dixon, on the other hand, knows nothing about Reddit. This is true, but I get all my information from Vincent, <clears throat> so I don't have to Reddit. <laughs> Dixon, what is this Toshiba factory farm? You know about no, this? Of course I do. You know, I, I, Toshiba, I, I think I've talked about this before. Panasonic and Toshiba have been 
sort of commandeered by the Japanese government to put aside their differences and to start developing commercial level vertical farms. And so, so Toshiba has actually done this in Japan proper, whereas Panasonic elected to go offsite for their first vertical farm, which is in Singapore. Um, but they're large operations, and they produce uh, substantial amounts of foodstuffs for the consumer public. I think you're going to see a lot more of that in Japan, and I think uh, for reasons obviously related back to that Fukushima event. But because of that, people will go to Japan to learn how to do these things and then bring that technology back with them or bring, as we have done in the United States, the automotive industry from Japan has invaded all of the failed automotive plants that we now mm. know uh, should not have failed, but of course from an arrogance and a neglect of technology. They did, and uh, what used to be a Ford plant is now a Mitsubishi plant, is now a Toyota plant, is now a Honda plant. That may eventually happen here, too, with regards to vertical farming. Uh, we have a lot of initiatives here that are successful, and, uh, and perhaps we can uh, shift that emphasis back to a U.S.-based economy. But I think Japan, if they invest so much of their energy and so much of their time into this, they consider it vital for the survival of the country, then you're going to see – that spread throughout every certain every uh, uh, urban center throughout the the uh, islands of Japan. Uh, that will spill over into the rest of the world, and perhaps they'll be the ones to empower sub-Saharan Africa in vertical farming. It it has to be done. It doesn't matter who does it, but it it definitely has to be done. So I think that's that's the uh, harbinger of things to come. I think this email was uh, prescient in its um, prediction of. Vertical farming as an adopted technology. You're so poetic. I tend to wax poetic about this because I dream about this tough stuff all the time. I really do. It's In just... Linden, New Jersey, there's a former General Motors plant yes. not far from Merck. Yes. Huge building just sitting there empty. It's closed. Yeah. Someone needs to put a vertical farm there. There you go. Did you just read that one? I didn't. I read you it. You did. Clyde writes, Dr. Dixon and Dr. Vincent. Have you seen the vertical axis wind turbines by Wind before? They are more efficient than conventional wind turbines, and they would probably look better mounted on the roofs of building in the urban farmscape. I will check this out, of course. They also claim that VAWT turbines don't kill birds like conventional wind turbines are said to do. What are your thoughts regarding these cool wind turbines? Clyde, I'll be glad to check them out for you, and perhaps the next time we answer emails. You should I'll, have done uh, it for this. Give show you my answer. Well, I... You know, obviously, didn't you're a do little it defective today. You're <laughs> chastising me again in public. I, I, I resent. That, I'll cut actually. it out. I'll cut it out. You should really have looked because I didn't. That's why we're reading. But I might be aware of them already. Look, click on the link. Do you know how to do that? I just did. They're different shapes, but I'm not sure why he says they don't kill wind. Well, of course, that kill, uh, birds. kill birds. He said they, they do kill the wind. Uh, they they also the conventional ones also kill bats, and that's a big problem. And they oh, could, I see what she's. I know. No, I'm very familiar with these. I, I've seen lots of examples of. Are these going to take over, Dixon? Nothing will take over. Not one thing will take over, but a, a variety of things. And these have great applications, and they probably don't make much noise either, because most most uh, wind capturing devices tend to either make noise or are extremely mm. large. Um, yeah, these are compact and uh, robust, and I think this is a good. Um, a good application of uh, capturing wind power. I haven't seen any of these in the wild. Not yet. I think they're all still experimental, and uh, you know, applications have yet to be um, fully. Realized. I always, I only see the ones that rotate like a fan yeah, blade, right. right? See them all over. When I used to go up to Alberta, I saw the ones that looked like egg beaters. They were quite amazing, <laughs> actually. And then I saw one of them collapse, and I realized that they weren't as. Uh, um, I use that word robust a lot, but in this case, I really mean it. I think that they weren't constructed to withstand the winds that they get in that part of the world, whereas the big rotators uh, are. I think you might want to purchase one of these and put it on your, your balcony, Dixon. Or yours. I don't have a your balcony. your backyard. <laughs> and you could see, you could save the electricity. Yeah, well, we have a and Use home... it to charge your car. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I use the the other motor to charge my car because I drive a Prius. But um, you're right. I think that the uh, application of passive energy collect, 
collectors is the future of off-the-grid city life. And I think this would make a nice contribution. You know what I'm looking forward to? What is that? Autonomous vehicles. Oh, right. Because I'm tired of this, you aggressive, go work for Google. They've already got this aggressive driving on the road. <laughs> That'll eliminate that. People are such jerks. Right? Not all the people. Not but all, there are but some. There's some people, you know, that if you want to move in the lane, they, they honk at you. It's nonsense. And then they come up to you and they make faces at you. No, remember, this is a show about agriculture. We're drifting. Oh, sorry. <laughs> car talk. Not, We're drifting. A, we should do a car uh, <laughs> podcast. But you don't know anything about cars, right? That's true. Todd writes, just a quick note to point out two indoor farms featured on Al Jazeera America. The use of red and blue LEDs as grow lights in the hopes of turning them tuning them for individual varieties combined with the idea of combining them with an indoor fish farm in order to use their nutrient-rich wastewater to fertilize the plants really made me realize how much more viable vertical farming is today. Several years ago, fluorescent lighting must have seen leaps and bounds over incandescent lighting. Uh, They claim a 98% recycling of water in one of these farms. I would have thought the plants would lose more than 2% through respiration. Do they keep the humidity higher in these farms to mitigate this? Thanks for all the podcasts, Todd in Northern California. Right. No, normally, they just dehumidify and recollect the water that way. So, yeah. So they keep the humidity down because if they didn't, then they would get a lot of um, annoying fungal infections that might develop along the yeah. seals of the windows or the doors and stuff like this. So you have to keep the humidity down, and the way to do that is to dehumidify. We've talked with uh, lighting people about tuning yeah, we have. Colors. What was that company in Texas? Lu- Illumitex. Ill- Illumitex. <laughs> Illumitex. But also Philips. I mean, everybody realizes that even though you're a green plant, and the green plant A and green plant B have different, slightly different requirements sure. for each of those light spectra. So fine-tuning them makes a big difference. And even the difference between a sprout and a fully mature plant the spectrum of light needed for both of those varies as well. So, And if you haven't listened yet, listen. go listen to number 18 with Caleb Harper. He talks about his his food box. Yes, he does. Where he records all these That's parameters right. so they That's can be right. emailed to people and grow their own exactly. things at the same exact conditions. Bingo. Isn't that amazing? It is. It is a, that's a wonderful addition to the, to the landscape of uh, indoor farming. Your turn, Dixon. Michael writes, Dear Dixon and Vincent, I wanted to thank you both for a wonderful podcast series. I always look forward to an email notification telling me when a new show is available. <laughs> you must, well, we don't do it often enough, so you must get a lot of sleep in between our, our podcasts. But when we make them, we make sure that they're high quality. I first came across vertical farming and urban agriculture just a year ago and was so intrigued that at the age of 30, I quit my job in manufacturing and took up a full-time traineeship in production horticulture. Since March, I have had the pleasure of training at Chisholm Institute, a high-tech glass house located south of Melbourne, Australia. The past nine months have been a whirlwind experience, securing a spot on an nth American study tour, visiting 18 farms across Canada, Mexico, and the U.S., with a visit to Lufa Farms in Montreal, being by far my favorite experience. And we're familiar with Lufa because they, too, have expanded their operation, and now they are in two facilities. Your podcast has been fantastic for a student like myself to keep up to date with all the latest technology and developments within the industry. Let's hope more young people decide to get involved in protected cropping and turn urban agriculture into a widespread widespread reality. Keep up the good work. Michael, when I spent six months in Melbourne, you've got Victoria Market as an outlet for your produce. The winters are pretty cold. They're not freezing like they do get sometimes up in Alberta, Canada, for instance, but they're still cold enough to stop the production of crop root shop from growing so indoor farming has a real application and i think australia is a world leader in creating indoor farming technologies and therefore i think that's a great place to start working being a horticulture person is great because remember that one in in jackson they were looking for a horticulturist they were not easy to find no they're going to be they're going to be in great demand over the next did they get one by the way they did they actually got applications from two and they're now busy trying to select the best one good Thomas writes, Dear Doctors Vincent and Dixon, in the 11 episodes you've produced, I haven't heard anything about space conditioning and the energy sources or amounts that are required to keep the growing spaces at the appropriate temperatures. Ah. Energy for lights isn't the only or even the biggest energy user you're around. 
This can play a large role in whether a building works and or is affordable, as well as the type of crops that would grow best depending on the time of year. Since many warehouse and factory buildings that may seem attractive for this type of operation were created without energy efficiency as key design elements, they can require substantial retrofits to make them work during seasonal extremes. Another thought that I was hoping you would explore is growing different types of crops depending on product availability and competition in the market, such as from traditional farms in the typical growing season. It seems to me that economically it may make sense to shift at least some cash crops during the harvest season of traditional farms when prices tend to be lowest. Of course, if you can convince the buyers to pay the same same higher price year-round, that may not be necessary. Right. I think the question of growing cash crops such as herbs and spice type plants for culinary or cosmetic purposes may be lucrative. This could help balance out the traditional summer harvest and keep the income revenue at high levels. These systems could, of course, be used year-round for herb production for industries such as essential oils who need the highest quality products near their stills. Some herbs are so lucrative that it may allow a vertical farm operation to work where it might be too expensive otherwise. I'm also very interested to see how we can scale a system for apartment dwellers where sunlight is at a premium as well as space. The health implications could be incredible for many on tight budgets who occupy these tiny units as well as availability, a great tasting, high nutrient food year round. Thank you for reading and addressing my questions and ideas. So Dixon, this idea of a building being energy efficient. Yep. I mean, I think after the first 11, we started to talk to people, right? We did, of course. So we did it. We do try to address them. And you know, and they some people have said to us some buildings we've looked at are not retrofitable. Yeah, the Green Spirit right? Farms people uh, went into detail about uh, why they chose the particular factory, abandoned plastics factory that they chose because it, it had already been retrofitted for insulation. Right. So they were able to maintain a temperature inside that ranged from sixty degrees in the in the winter to eighty five degrees in the summer, and that spread of temperature is well within the range of survivability for their plants. So mm-hmm. they had no difficulties achieving that whatsoever, with very minimal energy inputs, by the way, because the grow lights themselves do supply the heat yeah. for most of the wintertime needs. And in the summer, they have fans, of course, to cool the plants down and to make sure that they're happy. A lot of these individuals are not willing to discuss their costs with us. Costs are another problem. Right? So the energy costs uh, to keep a yeah, greenhouse right. warmer, that's cooler. Right. Right. I mean, in future, when we talk to farmers, I mean, the one in California we have coming up, yep. we should ask them, you know, what uh, are the costs for keeping the interior at the right temperature yeah. high or yeah. is it not a yeah. big deal or yeah. why? Yeah. See if he says anything. Sure. They may say, well, we can't really share that with you. Well, <laughs> Whatever. But I think the people in Wyoming, They'll share, uh, they would share it with us. Too. But we'll keep it in mind. I think it's yep. a good point. I totally agree. Um, okay. What, one more thing. Yeah, sure. um, what This this idea of, of rotating crops. We talked about that in Newark as well, I think. Uh, right? They did. And, of course, you start off with the high-income uh, producers uh, as your initial crops. But eventually you'll, you'll find that the people who buy them want to see a more diverse uh, sale of crops so that they can offer a wider menu item. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I think I've talked with uh, John Mooney, who runs a Bell Book and Candle restaurant in uh, the downtown area of New York, who we have yet to interview, but I would love to get him on the show sometime soon, um, is busy expanding his repertoire of plants into the root vegetable varieties and uh, things like um, broccoli, uh, avocados that's sort of those are not out of the question to raise uh, uh, in these systems as well so you're going to see a lot of that once the success of a particular grower is assured with their cash crops and that's quite literally meaning cash crops uh or steady customers uh, they'll be diversifying soon i'm sure of this because even they want to do that as well mm-hmm. all right all right you got it jim writes hi He just assumes that we both are here. Uh, Just wanted to pass on the future of agriculture, indoor farming powered by LED lights. That's a website that he's listed here that includes other links related to the topic. So I'll click on that right now. Beautiful, beautiful multi-rack indoor growing. Look at this. 1, 2, 3, (laughs) 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 racks, Dixon. I I see it. Well, that actually resembles the kind of facility that I saw in uh, College Station, Texas. Wow. For a caliber 
um, biopharmaceuticals where they were raising uh, plants for vaccine production and things of that sort. LEDs uh, can surpass 50% efficiency. Here, here. That's what it says. Here, here. All right. Thank you, Jim. And once that happens, of course, the energy considerations um, become less uh, of, of a problem and more of a solution to the profit margin that these places are involved with. Uh, Jim also writes, as a Jim again, he, an item from Boston I thought was you. It's a site called herb.ag. Concerns a citywide change to promote all sorts of local growing efforts. Right. No, that wasn't U R B dot A G. It's called the site is called Urban Agriculture, <laughs> which is of course also our site. Right. Uh, it's subtitled Plant Your Commercial Farm in Boston. This application integrates Boston zoning code to act as a preliminary guide in the opportunities available oh, in commercial no. urban agriculture. How about that? So you can search here and find places where you might be able to uh Build an urban farm in Boston. He has if, a third email, too, I see. Yeah. Might as well take that one as well. He has a third one. Here's another interview buried in this link to Dylan Retigan's blog is a link and comment about Archie's Acres, a venture in California. This would give you some West Coast coverage. <laughs> All we're, right. We're about to do that, actually, because that's where urban produce is. Do you know Archie's Acres? I don't. Well, let's go. Hey. There's a special rate for uh, Spirit uh, Airlines, then get on that. <laughs> okay, you can take the one from Joe. Joe writes, Vincent. No, no, no. Oh, what happened you should to take you? It. What happened to you? <laughs> I got dropped. Um, I would like to suggest you do a show on brightagrotech.com and their constellation of resources for modern upstart farmers, as they call us. Dr. Nate's story is a leader in the field. And the thought leader I turn to when my investors ask, what research have you done in vertical farming? I say, we use the technologies and educational resources of brightagrotech.com. I don't know anyone else that I can turn to for practical tools and advice on creating a profitable business in the urban slash vertical farming space. And he gives a link. Uh, they have an educational service called Upstart University, USU, that has a small monthly fee and our the finest educational resources available. Thank you for everything you do. Joe Terry, a.k.a. Farmer Joe. Do you know about Bright Agro Tech? I've heard of it. I don't know it directly, I'm sorry to say. We operate, we educate, equip, and empower growers with Zip Grow technology. So they have a proprietary growing system uh -huh. that they want you to buy. Uh -huh. And they also went to the world food thing, American Food.2.0. USA, but they have a picture of the walls growing here with their... Right. Okay. So Nate Story, who is listed here, is one of the developers of this technology, or am I yes, right Yes, that's this? correct. Is at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. So uh, Nate needs to go down to um, Jackson and visit their other Wyoming uh, counterpart and see what's going on down there. I highly recommend it. Robin writes, a few musings on agriculture in general. Coupled climate feedbacks will combine with irreversible, unstoppable food, water, soil, and biodiversity loss that will start in 20 years. Mm -hmm. This cascading collapse is the biological version of 911, the destruction of the crucial inner underpinning supports of life itself on Earth. And he gives a list of 49 links and things mm -hmm. about this. For example, in, the, in 10 years, we will f all fight for food and water on a scale never imagined. <laughs> right now, 1 billion people walk a mile each day for water. That's an interesting one, Dixon. It is. And, and a bunch of others. Drought is spreading across the earth. In 35 years, over 2 billion people will move to cities. By the way, all of these are really bad news items. And this is what spurred the class that I taught in 1999, listing these kinds of things to think about <laughs> You know, something positive, and that's how this idea about vertical farming arose. So yep. it's it, it's not unhelpful to list all of this and to keep people aware of the fact that we're heading down the wrong road. Dixon, is it true that we are losing 24 million acres of farmland each year? I, I haven't got my finger on that uh, statistic, but if, if that came out of the FAO, I would uh, totally agree with it. Hmm. All right. Uh, you can take Clyde's. Clyde writes, doctors DePommier and Racaniello. 
Below is a web link to Aleco, a wind turbine manufacturing company, another wind thing. I guess Peckwind must have gone out of business. So Aleco is another one of the alternative green energy companies that sells vertical axis wind turbines, abbreviated VAWTs. I hope this helps your cause pertaining to self-sufficiency and promoting a green energy future with vertical farms hmm. and self-reliance and not having to ride to- rely totally on the power grid. Sincerely, Claude. So this is the same technology we just talked about. That's right. So two hits for the same. I don't deal. know That's why you said mention. pack. I thought the, the former link linked to pack wind. You know, so I, I didn't know, know that either, but I've, I have actually been following the uh, passive energy capture strategies, including uh, photovoltaics and wind and tide and hydro and geothermal. All right, this uh, next one is from Sirish, who writes, can you please elaborate on the link in the differences? He sends a link to an article in the Healthy Home Economist entitled Organic Hydroponics Not For Me. Hmm. The reason for that is there is some resistance to anything done industrially or without the uh, connection to Mother Earth, so to speak. He says the reason is, Dixon, organic hydroponic produce produces big watery fruit that is very low in mineral content. In a nutshell, organic hydroponics is not nutrient-dense food and is basically a waste of money. Please rebut, Dixon. No, I don't have to do that, actually, because I don't run a hydroponic farm, but I think all the hydroponic farmers should rebut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert on hydroponics, but I think that if you go to... That's not hydroponics, that's aeroponics. <laughs> oh, okay. The one we, in Newark is aeroponics. aeroponics. That's aeroponics. Those are pretty juicy looking. They are very nice, but they're leafy greens. And I, one of the, um, one of the critic critical uh, issues is plant diversity Mm. all right so if you look at tomatoes for instance as a hydroponic product almost 90 percent of the tomatoes on the open market nowadays are hydroponically grown it's hard to disagree with uh, some of the critics that say many hydroponic brands of tomatoes fall short with regards to satisfying our need for tasting a good densely packed tomato but hydroponic farmers that know their stuff, like Eurofresh, for instance, down in Arizona, they know how to make a tomato that looks exactly and tastes exactly like an outdoor-grown tomato. And they can do it year-round. And in fact, they win tasting contests. So if you want a rebuttal to this, just go to their website and see what they have to say about it. I mean, they're advocating growing your own tomatoes in dirt. And that, that's not of the point we're making on this show. Of course it is. Because, you know, there's something called winter, and winter is uh, very difficult to uh, combat. But but anyway, we can use aquaponics and get delicious tomatoes, right, Dixon? Well, we can even use hydroponics and get delicious tomatoes. Excellent. I just told you about one yeah, yeah. out in Arizona. But there are many, many other examples of this. Gene Giacomelli, who runs the Controlled Environment Agriculture Unit at the University of Arizona, makes a big point about this. If you don't know what you're doing, hydroponics is no different than outdoor farming. You can use too much fertilizer, too much water, not enough of this, too much of that, and you're not going to get the right result. And, and the farmer that pays attention and reads the literature and does the right thing is going to get the right result. So This is a bogus article, Dixon. No, I think it is because it really criticizes an entire industry, and that's not fair to take a shot at the whole thing. Uh, it's really misinformation. And it's also on the same page, there is a link to an anti-vaccine site. So I think this is a completely bogus site. Well, then I would just dismiss it then. Can you read David's? Of course I can. David writes, Hello again, professors. Thank you again for starting this podcast specifically about vertical farms. I find the intersection of agriculture, biology, and technology fascinating. Listening along to your podcasts keeps me entertained and learning as I work in lab. I had a question about the root supporting and nutrient solutions Dr. DePommier refers to frequently. I vaguely remember from my early biology classes that there are many bacteria in soil that form commensal or symbiotic relationships with the roots of plants and that sterile soil can actually hurt plant growth. Nitrogen fixing bacteria in the root nodules of legumes being the most classic example. While the indoor growing industry seems focused on green leafy vegetables, does the nutrient broth need to compensate for the lack of bacteria? The weather is likely similar here as it is there, 26 C and sunny. Hope you're enjoying it also, David. And he's down at NYU. So, David, um, the answer is that if you want to grow 
plants in soilless conditions, you have to give them everything. Uh, some bacteria compensate for these things, like fixing nitrogen, for instance. But if you want to grow plants without the need for that, you're going to have to supply an organic source of nitrogen. And that comes in two forms. One is ammonium nitrate, which also allows the plants to uh, realize their nitrogen source, because uh, that's an organic source of nitrogen as well, or uh, ammonia. Um, and ammonia is in two forms, and one of them comes in the form of urea, so that they can split it and get the nitrogen this way, and they're both uh, uh, organic sources. Remember, in one of the early podcasts, I mentioned uh, Voller, the Swedish chemist, who was the first person to synthesize an organic molecule. And guess which organic molecule he synthesized? Urea. Exactly. And why do you think he picked urea as a molecule to synthesize? Not because it was simple. Because if you succeeded, you've got a built-in fertilizer now. You can use it outdoors mm-hmm. to supplement all of these uh, crops that you're growing that deplete nitrogen from the soil. You have to add it back. So the fertilizers used in hydroponic farming compensate 100% for whatever microbes might supply to those plants. That's the answer, basically. Just like you take cells in a cell culture and apply minimum Eagles medium plus calf serum or plus some other medium that grows the plant cell, or the animal cells, you're, you're, you're actually avoiding the bloodstream of an organism or the hemolymph of an organism to, by taking these cells and putting them in vitro. You, you now have to give them everything, otherwise they'll die. So the plants are in the same position here when we grow them uh, either hydroponically or aeroponically. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Robin writes, can urban agriculture be scaled up far enough, fast enough without fossil fuel, mineral ore, and rare earth inputs? Far enough for what? Uh, Fast enough for what? Um, The answer is that we've never had a problem of meeting the demands of a consumer public if the consumer public was willing to pay for it. Okay, so when Henry Ford first came up with the idea of Let's say the automobile, which he, that wasn't his idea, of course, but how do you mass produce the automobile? He invented the assembly line. And that became the gold standard for manufacturing not just automobiles, but lots of other things too. So with regards to vertical farming, uh, we just hit a website where you said, oh, look at all the rows of plants. One, mm-hmm. two, three, four. You got up to 20 and stopped counting. Well, I was in that building in Texas where the building was 18 stories tall. The building wasn't partitioned into 18 stories, but it had the equivalent height of an 18-story building. Inside, you would have stopped counting at 40 or 50, perhaps. Those were rack after rack after rack after rack of plants being aided in their growth by nutrient solutions and grow lights. And uh, ambient temperature that favored their growth, by the way. Uh, So what do you want and when do you want it? Mm -hmm. That's the whole question, because only your imagination limits when you can have all of that. And the answer is, of course, it's going to. I I think it will eventually. I think I'll make a prediction right now, and and it's pretty easy to make this one at this time in history. But it wasn't so easy to do this, let's say, five years ago, that within the next five to ten years, most cities will have some form of urban agriculture permanently insinuated into the infrastructure of the city. And many cities will be manufacturing up to 10% of what they consume. By, by 10 years from now, I think that will be the case. Either because we have to, or because it turns out to be very profitable to do so. All right, you heard it here. In 10 years, we'll see, Dixon. We will. I'll, I'll be back. He sends a link to a website called Desdemona Despair, the subtitle, Blogging <laughs> the End of the World. Yeah, well. And their quote is from Lily Tomlin, who said, things are going to get a lot worse before they get worse. (laughs) It's all about doom. And this article is about the loss of our arable land and how we can't have enough of it to feed 12 billion people by 2100. But Nixon, they don't even mention indoor farming. No, they don't. That's because their imagination has limited them to the outdoor world, and that's too bad for them, not for us. Uh, Len sends a link, and he, he writes, farming... This is the place to do it. He sends a link to the superconducting super collider. 
Yeah, if you can spend that much just trying to find out if there's a hadron, <laughs> a Bose hadron particle, you could probably spend a little less than that and develop vertical farming for the whole world. <laughs> when you look at how much that machine costs and what we've learned from it, uh, it makes so this it is difficult. the one. This is the one in, in um, Texas that was canceled. Oh, for it, that w- and uh, it's it's yeah. a eighty-seven kilometer ring. Yeah, and it's just sitting there. It's just sitting there. The, the building was built. And yeah. so Len is saying this is where we could do a vertical yeah, farm. It's a, huge, it's a huge building. It sure is. My gosh. It sure is. Well, everything is big in Texas. We know that. Here's another letter from Sharish, who writes, Hi, thank you for all the episodes. I have decided to set up a commercial farm based on urban agriculture. However, <laughs> confusion between adoption of which technology. At present... It does not matter what the above technologies are relevant for. I would like to learn from an episode explaining the details, fixed cost, running cost, types of crops, which is most suitable, maintenance issues in the downtime, organic, what's the difference between them and both ultimately produce chemicals as nutrients. Thanks, Sharish from India. Now, (laughs) Sharish from India, let me just explain something to you that everyone knows, and that is that all this information that you're requesting is not made available by the people in the business because they consider that proprietary. So that's why this, the last episode, not this one, but the one just before that, featured an individual working up at MIT who wants to open all of this up to the public so that you don't have to write us for the information. It'll be online and you can find it out for yourself. Open access. So none of this information is open access right now. And so as a result, I I really can't offer you any advice. Uh, Everybody has to invent this almost de novo, like everyone has to rediscover how how to make a wheel. That's really counterproductive to making an industry going forward. And I, I think that uh, the people such as Caleb Harper, and I know a lot of other people involved in this as well, that say, you know, it, we're not gaining any um, progress by keeping these things secret. We should open up our doors and let people see what we're doing so that we can share this technology with everybody. It doesn't matter what the technology is that you use. It matters how you use the technology. What about Henry Gordon Smith? Would he be of any use? Yeah, he would. I mean, of course, Henry and uh, Max Losel, they both run the Association for Vertical Farming. um, And they have a lot of information on their websites. But they, too, are frustrated by this uh, Hmm. closed-mouth approach. To I I met Max Losel in Holland, and he was working as an apprentice in Hmm. Plant Lab. They made him swear that he wouldn't share that information with anybody after he got out. And he hasn't done it so he's, he's kept to his word but unfortunately it's 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 inhibiting a lot of places from getting started so i'm a big fan of insinuating this uh, technology into universities and letting them play with it because at that point it becomes open source all right the next one is from tom hey guys i'm just getting started on a cea closed loop setup using aquaponics in northern alberta mm. and i'm looking for ways to support vertically stacked beds Originally, I was planning three stack 12-inch deep DWCs using secondhand painter's scaffolding, but at 4 by 8 feet, this works out to a lot of weight, about 800 kilograms each layer, so maybe shallow depth and microgreens is the only way I can vertically stack. I'm wondering what Dan used for his vertical support, or if you guys know of any great links and how much weight they hold. Is there somewhere I can purchase, and what is the fantastic material he is using to seed the microgreens? It sure makes the process look easy. Right. That was to the... um to the uh, Green Spirit Farms people. Uh, I think you should write them and ask them how they do it. Maybe they're willing to share that Not information. Green Spirit, Dan. It's the guy with the little room next to his house. Dan. Dan. Dan Albert. Yeah. Oh, but, oh okay. But the, oh, there's oh. another Dan, and that's the son of... Milan. Uh, so Dan Albert is this oh, okay. one. okay. And I sent him this oh, okay. uh, email, so maybe Dan will get no, in No, Dan would be happy to, support, to, to, to uh, share his information. Yeah, he's not him. hiding anything, right? Nothing. Much appreciated. Love the podcast. All right. Okay, Anthony writes, and these are short hits here. Margaret Atwood essay, he recommends, and we're reading this as we speak, and it's all about uh, climate change. And let's see what the gist of the article is. It's not climate change, it says. It's everything change. (laughs) And uh, oil, our secret god, our secret share, our magic wand, fulfiller of our every desire, and it goes on and on. Yeah, it's about a shortage of many things, change of many things, not just climate. It's another doomsday. It's all (laughs) interrelated. And, of course, there are a lot of shortages that will be created by an over-demand for lots of other things. 
Uh, it's how you address those technologies to supplant the current technologies. That's the way progress is made. So you have to think cleverly, and you have to think about the future, and you have to think about everybody's needs, not just your own. That's my opinion. David writes, Vertical Farm on NPR. All things considered, folks, we'll talk about some Vertical Farm thing in Newark today. I sure hope it's aired just as I arrive home to my driveway after <laughs> my typical Seattle commute. Right. Surely, at least for a moment, I will be glued listening. Thank you. Uh, from a longtime Twix advocate addict whose daughter at Washington State University is currently de-chaffing her, solu- her selections for graduate programs in virology, microbiology, and genetics. Suggestions? For your information, all podcasts are archived forever via iTunes and actively updated with Beyond Pod, an Android app. Currently 13C on a beautiful, partly sunny day here in Sammamish, Washington. With much appreciation, David. Um, I think uh, you knew about that coverage of Aero oh, sure. Farms, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And uh, they covered it, but we covered it first, Dixon. We did. Mm. Of course we did. Uh, if you re- if you want some suggestions, um, write us on, on twiv at twiv.tv, and over there we'll give you virology, microbiology, and genetic suggestions. Right. Well, I actually have a good friend who teaches at Washington State University. His name is Douglas Jasmer, J-A-S-M-E-R. I think, I think she's graduating from there. Well, that's right. But and you want uh, him to want her to go to him for advice? Yeah, because he's he's a, a friend of mine, and he's got a good head on his shoulders. He does work on uh, worms, uh, immunity to worms, or immunity against worms, I should say. Uh, and we've been longtime colleagues and friends, and so I, I I respect his opinions. And he may be a good uh, local person to sit down and talk with. Next one, Joseph writes, dear Urban. Agavangelists. <laughs> That's a good term for us. Hey, we I, could make that the title. The Agavangelists. Why not? I'd like to invest in a vertical farm hyphen centric company or subsidy, both to promote the cause and hopefully to make a few bucks off the deal. But <laughs> after researching public vertical farms, I could only come up with two the Mirai Company out of Japan and Indoor Harvest out of Texas. I don't have a foreign trading account, and Indoor Harvest hasn't made any reproducible products or processes nearest I can tell. So I'm not asking for investment advice, obviously, but are you aware of other publicly traded vertical farm-centric companies or even mutual funds? Well, that's You're asking for some very specific advice here. Um, I'm not an economist, so I'm really not up on all of the nuance of, of what you're asking. He wants but, to know if there, if there are publicly traded vertical farms. You, you'd know about them because you can go online and find yeah. out, and the answer is probably not yet. He wants to know if you know if any are coming online, I Dixon. do not know of any that are coming online, Vincent, <laughs> but I do know of some highly successful vertical farms that they could get in touch with, and maybe they could gain insight this For way. example, Aero Farms had a venture investment from they Goldman did. Sachs. That's correct. And at some point, I can imagine they will go public, right? If they succeed and if they come up with more than one venue, the answer is yes, of yeah. course. So Green Sense Farms, is, it looks as though they've already done that because of these uh, initiatives in China that they're engaged with now. So maybe they would be a good thing to get in touch with. I don't know. What's indoor harvest, Dixon? I don't know. Okay. Joseph is at Vanderbilt University. There's a man looking to invest. I know. Robin writes, thermodynamics of forest-driven biodiversity. For those who think vertical farms and urban agriculture will significantly ameliorate climate change. Mm -hmm. Another doomsday article, Dixon. There are lots of them, you know. There are lots of them. And you can read them all you want and get depressed as heck, or you can go out and do something about it. So this is a link. This is a Reddit page with links to stories about how terrible the uh, forest destruction has been and its impact on the environment. It is not good. Um, so you can check those out. All right. Next. It says, Dr. DePommier, I'm sorry, Vince, this is just for me, uh, can beans of all kinds and other plants with proteins be easily grown and harvested in vertical farms of the future? You don't need them in the future. They can already be grown now, and they're, they're very successful. Green peas of various sorts and beans of various sorts uh, can easily be grown uh, as a vine configuration in a vertical setting and, uh, and very successfully. So, yeah, the answer is yes. That's from Clyde, by Thank the you, way. Clyde. Peter writes, 
Dear Vincent and Dixon, here are some pictures of the U.S. Vertical Pavilion at the Milanese Expo 15 you mentioned in Urbag 17. We right. happened to visit today. Oh, second my. email will include pictures of the Israeli Pavilion with a vertical field. Nice. Best wishes to you, Peter of Wiesbaden, Germany. Ciao, altra volta. <laughs> That's nice. I will put the pictures in the uh, cool. show notes. Very cool. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Did you go to that, Dixon? No, I did not. Did you want to? I, in the, initially, I did, and then I got an interesting email from the architect who designed the U.S. Pavilion, and he, he said, basically, this, he said, this doesn't really meet the requirements that you've set forth for a vertical farm, and in fact, it doesn't. It's just a facade that grows food on the surface of the facade. So while it's uh, innovative... So it's a facade. It's a facade. <laughs> uh. Right, okay, so, the, the, so I lost enthusiasm, but I, I appreciate the fact that they use the term vertical farm. Okay. Okay, Sam writes, Dear Dr. DePamier and Dr. Racaniello, I am Sam Warren, a civil and architectural engineer student at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. I am an avid listener to your urban agriculture podcast and a great fan of what you're doing. The emerging vertical farm industry excites me and I intend to pursue a career in such a field post-graduation this year. I and two of my fellow students have been working on a research project into vertical farming and urban agriculture from a civil architectural perspective. As South Australia shares a similar temperate climate to that of Southern California, extreme weather events such as droughts can severely impact crop production, which makes food security and water conservation large issues to tackle. Clearly, vertical farming has a place here. However, we have run into a slight snag. Wherein lies my question. We were initially looking to optimize a vertical farm of our own design in Adelaide. However, the research component appears a little thin, and we have been criticized for lacking an engineering hook, a fresh component of our research that makes it new and innovative, and not simply a report on what's happening with vertical farming elsewhere and why we should adopt it in Australia. So where should a budding group of engineering students with a structural background seek such a hook? What sort of research could you foresee being paramount in the development of vertical farming here in Australia and elsewhere, be it structural or otherwise? And finally, where do you recommend seeking experience to be more valuable in this upcoming industry? Any resources, names, or insights you can offer would be greatly appreciated. I'm also attempting to make contact with your longtime pal and fellow AVF board member, Henry Gordon-Smith, to pick his brain. Z. Keep up the incredible work, and on behalf of my generation, thank you for being the voice of sustainable progress in agriculture. Best regards, Sam. So, okay, Sam, if I were in your shoes, uh, I would certainly um, have three areas of interest to concentrate on with regards to engineering. Growing systems, the structural growing systems, flatbed, aeroponic, hydroponic, fine, et cetera. And for that, any indoor growing system um, campus where this is taught as a subject would be good for you. And the one I can think of that's the most convenient and the most available for me is at the University of Arizona. Gene Giacomelli is an, a really guru person to, to talk with with regards to the structural units that are necessary for uh, root vegetables, leafy greens, et cetera, et cetera. And it gives you the whole spectrum of uh, possibilities. The second thing I would concentrate on uh, would be lighting strategies. And I think what you're really looking at for your area of the world, I spent six months in Melbourne, so I know that what the weather conditions are like down there, um, they can be fairly severe, is I think you're looking at LED lighting. So there are two places to go to for that. One is the country of Japan. They have huge numbers of LED lighting companies scattered throughout Japan, many of which um, produce highly efficient LED lights for indoor growing. The other one, of course, would be Philips. And Philips has now on their main campus, their research campus in Holland, uh, a model vertical farm that they're equipping with their latest versions of LEDs. So you could actually go there and learn a lot just by insinuating yourself into their uh, their factories. And then the third thing to, to, to look at is the kinds of crops that you can grow. And again, uh, Gene Giacomelli is good for that, although he does uh, specialize in things like tomatoes and, and green beans and things of that sort. But So Plant Lab would be another place to go to see what's going on. They will, of course, commit you to secrecy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they'll make you sign some non-disclosure agreement that uh, you won't share this with anybody else. They won't show you everything they're doing, but they will give you a good idea of what's possible with regards to indoor growing. 
So those three areas, the, the equipment, the lighting, and the kinds of crops, those are all things that, that by visiting these places, you can find out a lot. The last recommendation would be to go to Korea uh, and to the Rural, De- Rural Development Authority's uh, vertical farm in Suwon, and I'm sure that they would be glad to take you on a tour of it and show you how they do things there. Uh, and they, they would appreciate the fact that, uh, that you're trying to emulate what they've already done. So those are my uh, initial recommendations, and I, I don't know how far you can go with them. Henry Gordon Smith is a friend of mine. I just saw him yesterday, in fact. Uh, he's available. Just email him, and I'm sure that he will uh, share whatever information he has that might help you on your way to becoming bona fide vertical farmers in, a, in an area that desperately needs it. And so I'm really uh, heartened to see that uh, in Adelaide, <clears throat> South Australia, uh, that there, here's a group of people that want to get involved in this. And I, I think if you want to do it and you have the passion for it, you'll do it. So good luck. Robin writes, infrastructure doom, 25 million miles of new roads in 15 years, <laughs> spelled death for life on earth. Oh, dear. Another gloom and doom article. No, not interested. <laughs> I mean, I'm interested, of course, but I'm not interested in another gloom and doom article. Unfortunately, I spend too much of my time thinking positively to have room for that. I'm so, sorry to say. Next one or is yours. Uh, Tarwin writes, I can't remember if you do a pick of the week, and I wish we did, but we don't. But I was impressed with this article in Bloomberg about an urban, actually underground farm in an old bomb shelter under London. And actually, we've referred to yeah. that in the past. So Some people have previously <laughs> mentioned this. We're quite aware of it, and uh, it's a very innovative use of indoor space. And uh, <laughs> why not use it? Of course, it's completely devoid of sunlight, so everything has to be grow lights. Um, but they've worked it out. Kevin writes, Dear Dixon, this might be a shot in the dark, but I figure I had nothing to lose. I'm a young college student from Florida. My good friends and I are in the process of writing a business plan for our dream business, a vertical farm in Miami. Nice. I study sound engineering, and my goal is to incorporate an ultrasound system to Mm. stimulate the plants. Mm. I will be in New York City for work the 26th and 27th of September. It would be an honor to meet with you. Please know if this is a possibility, any wisdom you have for me can help. (laughs) Well, I'll be around on the 26th. I won't be around on the 27th. So when you get into New York, uh, give me a call at 212-305-1494, and we can set something up. Boy, he would be thrilled to meet you, Dixon. I'd be thrilled to meet him. Last one. Carney writes, great podcast. My documentary about ver- urban farming around the world is now streaming online, attached as a press relief release. I'd love to be a guest and tell you about my travels. So this- It's called, it's called Plant, Plant This, this movie. movie. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what it is. It's pretty cool. This is good. We're going to certainly post that on the show notes because there's we trailer, love videos. There's a trailer. We love videos. And it's narrated by Daryl Hannah. Get out of here. Is that true? Yeah. I'll be darned. Oh, that's great. We think we should uh, have... Um, Maybe we should have Daryl Hannah on our show. <laughs> well, I would be speechless. Um, I think you should be because you allowed her to do the talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's have Carney on. Sure. I'd, I'd be interested to see what he did in his travels and what he thinks of all this stuff. You bet. He's well, a filmmaker, right? Yes. So, Carney, send us your email. We've got your email address. Yeah, I've I got it. We can get in So, touch. we'll be happy to feature you on a show sometime soon. And that will do it for Urban Agriculture number 19. We're approaching 100, Dixon. <laughs> Very slowly, but we definitely are. You can find it at iTunes and also at urbanag.ws. And if you have questions or comments, please send them to urbanag at urbanag.ws. Dixon des Pommiers can be found at verticalfarm.com, the father of the vertical farm. <sighs> Pater Farmus Verticus. Well, to, Thank you, you Dixon. Father, you're welcome, Vincent, but I must respond to that by saying for every father, there has to be a mother. So who is the mother of vertical know. farming? It was parthenogenetic. <laughs> it was parthenogenetic. The males don't usually practice parthenogenesis. No, we don't. <laughs> you can't make anything from a sperm, nothing, can you? Nothing. <laughs> it's useless. Okay. Dixon, thank you so much. Oh, you're quite welcome. I'm then. sorry I picked on you all the time. No, it's okay. It's okay. But you're you such a take good sport. Personally. And, you know, fishermen, usually you can pick on them. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on urban agriculture is performed by John Harrison with the Wichita State University Chamber Players 
and Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Urban Agriculture. There's no such show. (laughs) You've been listening to Urban Agriculture. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Vince, I'll see you upstairs at the vertical farm. I'll be there. <laughs>